All right guys, this is Matt from Hearts Geeks and we have got the new edition of 40k, so 8th edition run now. Um, I thought about doing like a, an unboxing for the new <coughs> for the new box, new Dark Imperium box, um, but everybody's done a, you know, an unboxing of a Dark Imperium box. Yeah, if, if you want to go and see what's actually in the box, you can always just check online or go on YouTube. Um, there's, there's, there's loads of people that did it. Um, I got my rule book obviously from the uh, Dark Imperium box itself. I also ordered the um, index books. I ordered four in the end. Uh, I think I ordered the Imperium Volume One, Xenos One and Two, and the Chaos, uh, the Chaos One as well. And and I ordered them from uh, Weekend Warlords. Uh, you can check them out online. They do uh, fifty percent, fifteen percent off. It was it would be nice if it was fifty, um, but fifteen percent off um, all Games Workshop products. So that's everything from um, books, miniatures, to paints, brushes, um, everything. So they're quite consistent about that. Uh, they sell everything. They sell a lot of other things as well. So they sell uh, um, like Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Pokemon cards, a um, load of other tabletop war games as well. Um, Star Wars, Armada, X-Wing, um, they sell all sorts. So yeah, go and, go and check them out. They're really good, uh, really good store, really good guys. The, the ship um, to anywhere in the UK and Ireland, and I'm pretty sure they do all worldwide as well. So <clears throat> the reason why we're all here is obviously the 40k uh, 8th edition. Um, now this is going to be uh, my review, it's going to be my own thoughts, my own opinions. Um, I have managed to play a couple of games with some of the guys I know down local shop. So I'm coming at it from a, a different angle. Those of you that watched the sit and paint uh, video I did uh, a week ago, a couple of weeks ago now, um, that they were my like initial thoughts from what I've heard from rumours. Uh, things like that. Obviously, I didn't actually have my uh, my hands on the rule book like I do now, so I couldn't give it a, a proper, you know, judgment kind of thing. But now I've had a had a couple of games. I've read the rules. Um, that I've seen some of the FAQs as well that Games Workshop have released. We'll talk about them. So, the rule book. <clears throat> there is a lot. It might look thick. I mean, it is thick. It's about nearly 300 pages. Um, in fact, I can tell you exactly how many pages it is here. It is 280 pages, 200, about 281 pages in total. Um, all of this, all of this here is fluff, um, artwork, background story, uh, campaign story, tells you about the history of 40k, what's happened between from the start to now, tells you what happened between um, Abaddon's Crusade, um, so the Gathering Storm stuff, and the aftermath of that. I think this this rule book is actually set about 50 years after the uh, Storm Storm of Chaos. I think it's called. I think it was called. Um, so yeah, it's, re it's really really good. I'm not going to go into all the fluff and background and stuff. Um, I suggest you know people read it. Is is if you're into the fluff and you're into the backstory, definitely read it. It's, it is uh, a really good read. So what we're going to do <coughs> is um, how we're going to set it out is we're going to talk about the rules in sections. So we're going to start with movement phase, go into the psychic phase, shooting phase, and then um, morale phase. Um, like I say, these are going to be my own views, my own opinions from what I've seen, what I've learnt myself, and what I've read. Um, so yeah, so let's get started. Right, core rules. Obviously, you have your uh, data sheets for so all your models and things um, that come from obviously the indexes. Um, starts off obviously telling you about movement phase, psychic phase, shooting, charge phase, fight phase, and the uh, morale phase. There. So straight away, we've got the movement phase. <clears throat> Not really much about the movement phase. Doesn't really cover much about the mu movement phase. Really, I think it's literally just one page. So everything now has a movement value. So in the index books, your standard uh, basic marines have a movement value now of, I still believe it's, I still think it's six actually off the top of my head. Uh, I think a lot of Eldar models have movement seven, uh, jet bikes have like movement 16 or 18 and um, vehicles have varied movement depending on what they are. Um, so there's not really much to, to touch on really about the movement phase. Um, do I th uh, 
I don't really think it's such a bad idea. Obviously, bringing back movement, movement values and stuff, it brings a bit more variety to the game rather than it just be an infantry model and all infantry models move six. Naturally, hormigants will move quicker than you know space marines. Um, space marines have got a movement of six. I think hormigants have got a movement of eight, um, which which is right, which is you know how it should be. Um, I think introducing the movement values to the game has brought a bit more realism into it. Um, um, over here on, in, this, in this page it talks about that. Basically, that's a rundown of what it is. If you want to move a model, you're going to move it to your up to your maximum. You don't have to move it its maximum, you can move it up to your maximum and no model, no part of the model can be um, further forward than, than it should be. So you can't just like measure from the front of the base and then end its movement on the back of the base kind of thing. Um, it's obviously to creep forward really. Um, minimum movement, the only things that have minimum movement are flyers, um, so some flyers have a minimum movement of 20, um, we'll cover flyers when I want to come to the, the flying section I suppose. <laughs> uh, enemy models, you can't come within one inch of an enemy model, which is up here basically, if you're within one inch of an enemy model you, you're class is charging, so you can't physically walk into combat, you have to physically charge, so you must stay more than one inch away from an enemy model unless you're charging. Falling back, exactly the same. If you fall back, um, exactly the same as that, the, the top one, so enemy model. So if you fall back, you've got to be one inch away from an enemy model again. Now, falling back is done in the movement phase. It's a bit, it's, a, well, it's very, very different to how it used to be. You, If you have a unit that's in combat and you know you're not going to win or you're losing or you want to shoot at the other unit in the enemy, the enemy unit, you can elect to voluntarily fall back almost like a hit and run from 7th edition apart from there's no dice rolled you just elect to fall back with that unit uh, if you fall back you basically move your movement your your uh, movement range so if if you are a say dark eldar you're in combat with a dreadnought uh, your dark eldar have movement at 7 so you move all of your dark eldar away from that dreadnought 7 inches and you can't be within one inch of, within one inch of that dreadnought. If you fall back voluntarily from combat, you cannot move because obviously that is your your movement away from the dreadnought is actually your movement. You can't shoot anything. You can't advance, which is basically run, so you can't run anywhere, and you can't charge anything unless it specifically says in your data sheet, which is in, obviously in the indexes and stuff. Uh, advancing, advancing is basically running. Um, it, yeah, instead of running in the shooting phase, you run in the movement phase now. I think it's just made it a lot easier, a lot more streamlined, rather than having to move your models, uh, you know, say, Space Marine bikes, you would obviously move them 12 inches, and then if you're, if you're going to run or turbo boost or whatever, you're going to move them again in the shooting phase. So rather than just take time moving it and then coming away and then moving it again, just doing it all in one phase, I think just makes it a bit more streamlined, a bit easier. Um, my views on falling back, I might, I might as well talk about falling back actually while I'm here. Uh, falling back, I think it's quite a good thing. Um, the difference is now in this edition you can obviously wound anything now. You, there's no cap on what you can and can't wound. Um, so, But if you think you're not going to particularly do well in, in a combat, you can voluntarily fall back. Which then leaves the, the enemy unit stranded in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere, so you can literally just blast it with whatever weapons, shooting weapons you've got. You can then counter charge it with a different unit, because obviously you can't, you can't charge into combat with uh, the unit that's just fallen back, unless stated in your, uh, unless stated in your data sheet. So I think falling back's a, a good thing. I think it's quite, quite a good mechanic. Really, it op opens it up for a lot of, um, a lot of strategy. Really. Um, uh, did it happen in my few of my games? Yeah, it has happened in a few of my games actually. Um, Dark Eldar vehicles, well, all vehicles can now charge. Um, my Dark Eldar raider uh, charged into a unit of. I can't remember what they were now. It was an Admech unit. I can't quite remember what they were. It was the guys with the the tracks um, for for feet basically. Um, they had a big cannon on the shoulder, so basically my raider charged straight into them. Um, first turn charge as well somehow. I don't know how it worked, but yeah, basically a first turn charge I was quite quite lucky with the dice roll. Um, and I tied that unit up in my opponent's round. So obviously I charged in, did some damage, um, 
then in his round he could either attack me back in combat or he could fall back. He elected to fall back, um, which means he couldn't shoot at me at all with that unit. Everything else could still shoot at me, um, but at least that unit that was qu quite devastating against vehicles wasn't actually able to shoot at me, so I was able to pretty much subdue that unit from shooting that turn. He then literally shot everything he could do at the Raider because there was a unit of grotesques in it. Uh, the Raider managed to survive, which was nice, and then the grotesque jumped out and basically wrecked face about with whatever they got in combat with. Um, so yeah, so falling back is quite a good thing. Um, obviously because my opponent fell back, he was then able to shoot with everything into it, but I was able to do that charge and tie up that unit. So it's, it is quite a good mechanic. I do actually quite quite like that mechanic. I, one of, I think, I don't know whether I spoke about it in the sit and paint video. Um, whether I did or not, I can't remember. Um, but I wasn't too sure about that mechanic to start off with when I first heard about it. Um, after actually playing a game, um, I actually quite like the mechanic now. I think, I think it's quite good. It's quite quite good tactically. Um, it adds a, another mechanic to the game. So going on, we'll actually do these sidebars as well because I don't know why, but they actually put these little side, some side rules in the in the actual sidebars. The downside to that is people will overlook them. Um, I don't think it's particularly set out. It's set out okay, it's set out on a, on a very basic level, but in, unless you're actually looking at it, you know, you're not going to read it. You're just literally going to read this part that's, you know, in the border highlighted. Wobbly model syndrome. If you can't physically place a model, um, it keeps falling over, you know, rolling down a hill, or you can't sit on rubble properly or whatever. You basically talk to your opponent and you, you say, my, my model is actually here, but I can't physically place him. Uh, which is which is you know okay. You talk to your opponent about it. You know it's quite good. Um, I always like the fact. I always try to do the fact that if you can't physically place a model, you know the model can't stand there. Um, it just adds a bit more. You're a bit more. It's, you know a bit more tactics to the game. A bit more variety. So you know it's if someone's made a nice bit of scenery and you can't physically put a model there, then you know it shouldn't be able to stand there, kind of thing. Uh, reinforcements. Um, Basically, you can um, when you start setting up the your uh, setting up your models on the battlefield, you can choose to have some models be set into res basically while it was re was reserve. Um, they now just come onto the board, whatever turn you like, uh, one, two, or three. Anything after turn three, if you don't bring anything on, if so, if you just try think think about saving something until turn four, if you've not brought it on by turn three, it's destroyed. So it's something to remember. Um, your opponent should, it depends on who you're playing. If you're playing in a tournament, your opponent might say, well, no, you forgot about that, they're destroyed. If you're playing competitively. If you're playing against friends in a local store, you know, your opponent should just be like, yeah, well, I just bring them on. Uh, don't forget, <laughs> you know, just bring them on now. Don't, But they can't do anything kind of thing. So that's just a case of talking to your opponent um, and changing in that way. So we'll go on now to the uh, psychic phase. Okay, the psychic phase has changed quite a bit. Um, all the rules have changed quite a bit, really. Um, but they give you a nice little uh, red box here just to tell you how uh, what's the best way to have it in sequence kind of thing. So the psychic phase sequence, choose a psychic and psychic power, make the psychic test, enemy takes to the witch rolls and resolve the psychic power. So how it works is we will use a Eldar Farseer, for example. Um, Eldar Farseers can cast two spells two psychic powers spells as whatever um can cast two psychic abilities per turn um they have two psychic powers you can actually choose them um and i think it's on a it's on a d3 chart so you can obviously roll a d3 or you can choose them i don't know why they gave you the choice because you're always going to choose you know, it's just a lot easier so you, you know you're guaranteed to get what you want to get all psychers come with this psychic ability smite down here so you choose um, your Eldar Fars here, and he's going to cast Smite against a unit of Space Marines. So you've chosen your Psyker, you've chosen your Psychic Power. You then need to make your Psychic Test. Now Smite uh, is a warp charge value of 5. So what that means is basically you have uh, 2d6, and you roll them, and you need to get 5 or more. If you get less than 5, it's failed to cast. Um, there's obviously additional rules here as well. Um, so smite is a casting value of five. 
If manifested, the closest visible enemy unit within 18 inches of the Psyker suffers D3 mortal wounds. So you basically got to cast it at the closest enemy unit. It can be anything. It can be a tanks, vehicles, space marines, um, jump pack infantry. It's, it's basically the closest thing. Now when it states the closest visible enemy unit, it literally means the closest visible enemy unit. Um, there's no way around that. There's no way to get around that at all. Um, also states at the bottom, if the result of the psychic test was more than 10, the target suffers D6 mortal wounds. So rather than D3, you actually cause D6, but that means you have to roll a 10, 11 or a 12 on a um, psychic test um, to, obviously cast, to obviously deal more damage. Now, a mortal wound, you may ask, is basically a wound that cannot be saved at all. A normal armor save and invulnerable save is completely ignored. Um, so yeah, so mortal wounds are pretty harsh. Um, then you can have obviously an enemy denies the um, enemy can make a deny the witch roll. How that works is the whoever you're casting the spell at can possibly deny it if they have a a, um, a friendly psycho within um, was it thing um, well within 24 inches yeah so so a friendly psycho can attempt to deny it. They can only attempt to deny one psychic power a turn. So if you've got if you're against the Farseer, so your 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 elder opponent has one Farseer and you have two librarians, you can obviously deny two psychic powers. Unless stated in your data sheet, some psychers can deny two a turn, some can deny three. It just depends on what, what it is. Denying the psychic power, whatever your opponent rolled, so if your opponent rolled a six on two D six, so it's successfully cast it, if you're trying to deny it, you must beat the sick you must beat it i don't think you have to match it i think you actually physically beat it um let's have a look uh, <clears throat> a psychic can attempt to resist the psychic power that has been manifested by an enemy model within 24 inches by taking a deny the witch test this test takes place immediately even though yeah, it is not your turn so obviously you, you can automatically deny well not automatically but you can take one but it's no change from last game last edition really um, to do so, roll 2d6 if the total is greater than the result of the psychic test. So yeah, basically you have to beat it. So if you rolled, if your opponent rolled a 6 to cast it, you have to roll a 7 to beat it. Um, again, on people's data sheets, there's, people might get bonuses to plus 1 to, 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 deny, the, to deny the witch. I couldn't see it then. Um, so yeah, so that's that. So if you fail to deny the witch and your opponent gets... To cast smite, obviously, so the Farsi has successfully cast a smite. That's when you resolve the psychic power. So it's quite quite well laid out, as in how you step by step, you know, you choose a psychic power, you, you cast a psychic power, make it another witch, and then you resolve it. Perils of the warp, which is up here, it's obviously in the nice in the box here to tell you how important it is, and it is very important. It can be very brutal depending on what what it is. Um, if you roll a double one. Or a double six when taking a psychic test, the psychic immediately suffers a perils of the warp. So it is done straight away. That's when you're rolling the dice. It's not done at the end of the psychic phase, it is done straight away. Uh, the psychic suffers D3 mortal wounds as the forces of the warp basically open up and demons claw at his mind. So, yeah, the psychic is going to have a bad day if you roll the perils of the warp. Um, so it's, the psychic will suffer D3 mortal wounds straight away. That, that's, you know, we've covered mortal wounds already, so there's no save, there's no invulnerable. You are literally taking D3 wounds. If the psychic is slain by perils of the warp, the power they were attempting to, to manifest automatically fails. That's why it's done straight away. Um, rather than after because obviously if you roll you know if you roll double one double six whatever and your psyker has only got one wound he dies the the these psychic bit psychic powers automatically fail straight away so that's why it's done that's why it's done immediately uh so where were we the psyker is slain the, the psychic power attempt to manifest it automatically fails and each unit within six inches immediately suffers D3 wounds as the Psyker is dragged into the warp or or detonates and bursts in... Oh, nice. Basically bursts into a, a pile of mulch. Yeah, so 
all your one wounded psychers, if you roll the perils of the warp, you're not only going to kill yourself, but you're also going to kill D3 models from, or D3, cause D3 wounds to everything within six inches. That's your vehicles, that's your units, that's your independent character, that's your other characters that are too close to him, so yeah. Psychic powers are a bit different compared to what they used to be, and they can be very, very brutal. Um, the, one of the games I've played, we actually had psychers in it, and it, it didn't actually come into effect, luckily. Um, my opponent kept using command rolls to re-roll re -roll double, you know, the, the extra one or the extra six to stop it from exploding. Going into the sidebar, obviously I have a little, little extra bits and bobs in these uh, in the sidebars here. Uh, Rerolls, it's exactly the same. You basically choose if if you have an ability that allows you to re-roll a dice, you basically can pick it up and re-roll it if you fail. Um, but you can never re-roll a re-roll. So if you have an ability that makes you re-roll something, you roll it, and that's what that's what you're going to get. You can't then use a command dice to re-roll it because obviously then you're re-rolling a re-roll. Roll offs um, again. There's, there's no different here. So both players roll off. Um, both players roll a dice. Whoever 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 gets the highest on that dice, you know, automatically wins that roll off kind of thing. Um, if the dice are the same, you obviously re-roll it, and that is the only time in 40k and in most games actually you can actually re-roll a re-roll. If you and your opponent keep rolling double two, double two, double two, double two, you you. Obviously, you're hexed for rolling double two so many times. Shame on you. Um, but that's the only time you can physically re-roll a re-roll. Um, sequencing at the bottom here uh, just basically means... Uh, I play 40k. You can occasionally find that two or more rules are to be resolved at the same time. So if, you're, if you've got two, two units that both arrive turn one, at the start of turn one or start of the battle phase, whatever you want to call it, um, you don't, they don't just automatically both appear. You do you do one at a time, so sequencing. Uh, so yeah, so that's it for the psychic phase. So yeah, some big changes there. Um, I don't think it's going to make too much of a difference. Um, I never really used that much psychic stuff in my previous games anyway. In, in seventh edition, um, I think it's a lot harsher. Uh, obviously, rolling double six or double one would just be mental. Um, I personally wouldn't change it. I think it's quite fair. Obviously, just having two d six now and trying to cast cast an, an ability uh, in previous editions, you, you know, people could abuse it. You know, you could have a far seer and so many independent warlocks and in squads. So you could actually take two far seers and then you could take a warlock in every um, you know uh, what they call jet bike squads and every guardian squad. Uh, you know, that it was really easy to abuse. You'd all, you can, you know, usually get an opponent that has so many casting dice. And if you're playing like Necrons, Tau, uh, Dark Eldar, you are literally stuck with whatever they rolled for a D6. So it just gives it a level playing field now. Um, I think it's a lot better, a lot streamlined. Um, I'm actually really happy with how the psychic phase has turned out. So uh, yeah, so we'll now go on to shooting phase. Again. Does it all appear in the seat in the sequence? So you've got a uh, choose unit to shoot with, choose a target, choose a ranged weapon, and then you have you resolved your attacks. So resolving attacks basically means you make a hit roll, make a wound roll, enemy allocates wounds, enemy makes saving throws, and then you inflict damage at the end. So we'll we'll go through it all one you know one by one just to, to make it a lot easier. Uh, choose a unit to shoot with. It, it, it kind of, you know, says exactly what it's, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Really, um, if you've got something with a gun, you can say, "I'm going to shoot with that unit. I'm going to shoot with that unit. I'm going to shoot with that. whatever." You know, you can basically just choose who you want to shoot with. Um, choose targets. This is where it starts to vary a little bit. Um, so you can obviously choose. You've chosen your Space Marine Tactical Squad. Uh, the tactical squad is it's got 10 space marines 10 space marines in it it's got eight marines with bolt guns one marine with a plasma gun and one marine with a las cannon for example so you choose your target so you can choose who you're going to shoot at now the good thing with this with the eighth edition is you can actually split your fire uh, which i think is a step in the right direction really um it's i mean how often was it you would see 
a 10 man tactical squad with a plasma gun and a las cannon um, shoot a, a tank so your one las cannon could do something at a land, at a land raider your plasma gun probably not so much and then you're wasting your your um, other eight bolter shots in the new edition you can split your fire so that's when you that's when you choosing targets comes into the you know the main factor so you can say right my last cannon's firing at the um the eldar wave serpent my plasma gun is going to fire at i don't know one of your wraith guard and the rest of my bolters are going to fire at that guardian squad over there now you have to actually choose your targets before you roll any dice um Again, if you're playing in a tournament, your opponent can be a bit awkward about it, saying, oh, you didn't choose to, to shoot with that, so you can't do all this, that, and the other. So always choose your targets you're going to shoot at before you roll any dice. Um, you don't, it's not, some people seem to think that it's per weapon type, so obviously if one bolter shoots at one target, all the bolters have got to shoot that, shoot that target. That's not how it works. It, you can actually split it, so you can have four, four bolters shoot at them rangers, four bolters shoot at the guardians, plasma gun shoot at that, last gun shoot at that. So it, you can really split your fire here, which, which is, I think it's a lot better, it's a lot more cinematic, it's, it's how it would be. Um, you can do a sustained fire, you can, you can have everything shoot at one target if you want to, you can split your fire. You know, Mar Marines aren't um, you know, aren't just robots that shoot at the closest enemy target. You know, the the, the you know, the enhanced superhuman soldiers that have been training for hundreds of years. You know, that this, you know, they should be able to shoot at whatever they want. And it's the same for Eldar. You know, Eldar or, or Dark Eldar have lived for hundreds of years. Uh, some of them thousands of years. Some of them hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, you know, they should be able to shoot at who they want and what they want. Uh, choosing weapons again. We've, we've basically covered that in choosing your targets, uh, so you can shoot at shoot at whoever you want, basically. Um, but you have to allocate who you're shooting at before you roll any dice. Number of attacks. Um, this basically signifies, you know, how many shots your gun has. Um, so it's the same as same as previous previous edition. So if you've got assault two weapons, obviously each weapon can shoot. Uh, Oh dear, my mouth isn't working. If you've got assault two weapons, you can obviously shoot twice. If you've got a, a rapid fire two weapon, it is two shots at maximum range. If you become within half range, it's double that, so it's four shots, um, which is which is nice. Um, so while we're on that subject, we might as well touch on weapons and how they've changed as well, actually. Yep. Weapons then. So weapons have changed a bit different. Some of them have changed a bit different. So you've got rapid fire weapons. They're kind of the same. So they are. So a rapid fire bolter, say, is is rapid fire one. So it's one shot, 24 inches. If you are within half that range of 12 inches, you get two shots. You know that's not changed. It's still rapid fire, is still the same. Assault is slightly different. Um, assault means. Um, if you've got an assault to, well, I don't know, Dire Avenger or Dire Shuriken Catapult, something like that, um, that match actually means you can still shoot it while you run. So while you're running, while you're advancing, sorry. So you, you, um, if you're a Dire Avenger, you movement seven, you advance D6, so you roll D6, and that's how far extra you move. But because you've advanced, you're not really supposed to be able to shoot. So things that are heavy, rapid fire, whatever, you know, you, you can't shoot if you've advanced. Assault weapons can still shoot if they advance. All that means is they're a minus one to hit. So your marine that is advanced with a plasma gun, um, he's not threes to hit anymore because he advanced, he's fours to hit. Which is, you know, I think it's really good. Uh, it's quite a good mechanic. It signifies that you're literally running through the, running down the battlefield. You're firing off your hip. Um, so yeah, it's slightly harder to hit, but you know, you can you can still shoot. I, th I think that's quite good. Uh, heavy weapons are exactly the same. Heavy weapons, you can move and shoot them now. Um, but if you move at all, they are at minus one to hit. Um, that goes with vehicles as well, unless it states in their data sheet that they, you know, don't suffer for any pen any penalty. Um, so some tanks are at minus one to hit obviously if they move with their heavy weapons uh, I think a Lehman Russ is minus one to hit with its side sponsons but its main turret battle cannon or, or whatever it's armed with is is no modifiers um, 
you know, which which is quite nice. Uh, so yeah, so that's rapid fire, assault, heavy. Uh, I think that's it really. And then it, obviously it covers, you know, you go into some things have heavy D6, um, assault D3, whatever. So it's exactly the same. Assault D3 is you roll a you roll a dice, uh, and if it's uh, if it's a two, you get one shot. If it's a, well one two one shot, three four two shots, five six three shots. And there is some, there is plenty of them, those kind of weapons out there. Same for heavies, you know, you get heavy D6 shots, um, heavy 2D6 shots, and that signifies obviously you're not, you're not just yet getting that's how many hits. Some of them are, uh, but so they don't nothing, you know, not everything automatically hits. So I think a heavy battle cannon is, I think a battle cannon is D6 shots. So obviously you roll D6 shots, if you get a 6, that means you get 6 shots, you then have to roll to hit, so you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean you automatically hit. So that's um, that's all I'm going to go into really for, you know, weapon types and stuff, we're going to go back into the back into the shooting phase. Right, back into the shooting phase, so we've got characters at the bottom here, obviously um, in a nice border here to tell you about characters. Uh, some models are noted as being characters on their data sheet. Now this goes into all the keywords in the data sheet. Um, so uh, some models are classed as infantry, characters, bikes, jump infantry, whatever. Um, if they've got the, the character keyword in their data sheet, they're basically this is an extra rule that they get. Uh, okay, so let's start from the beginning again. Uh, some models uh, are noted as being characters on their data sheet. These heroes, officers, prophets, and warlords are powerful individuals that can have a great impact on the course of the battle. Uh, the swing and maelstrom of the battlefield can make it difficult to pick out such individuals uh, as targets. A character can only be chosen as a target in the shooting phase if they are the closest visible enemy unit to the model that is shooting. This does not apply to characters with the wound characteristics of 10 or more due to their sheer size. So, what that means is you cannot physically shoot an enemy character if it is not the closest target. Um, if, the if the character's got 10 wounds, uh, 10 wounds or more, uh, it states that, so 10 or more, not, not up to 10, it's literally 10 or more. You can target him. That's that's to signify how big he is. You know, he might be on a chariot. He might be on a a dragon. Um, he might be on a might be on a tank. You know, might be on whatever. Uh, he might be a monster. You know, you don't know. But if he's got under ten wounds, so one to nine wounds, you can't physically target him unless he's the closest target. Um, a couple of the couple of games that I've played, I made some. Uh, me and my opponent made a couple of mistakes on this because we had a situation where um, we had... Um, have we got any models here? Yeah, let's, let's get some models and have a quick look. So we've got, let's say, have we got any characters somewhere? That'll do. So obviously this is a character. So the character's slightly further away. We've got one model here that's in combat with Let's try something different. You'll do. Oops. So you've got a combat going on here. Your character's here. And then you have another enemy model, which is here. So this enemy, this model, enemy model, wants to shoot at this character. Now, even though these are in combat, they are still the this enemy model is still the closest model compared to the, the, the character, even though the character is open, free line of sight, you can physically see it. Um, you know this model can't even shoot. This model can't even shoot into combat. Um, you still can't target him because this enemy model is closer. Um, it, I'm pretty sure that's how it worked out. I'm sure it's been FAQ'd now. Um, Personally, I'm not a big fan of that because you can't physically shoot this model. So why isn't this model a you know a valuable viable target? Um, me and my opponent played it the other way. Um, obviously, because he's this model is locked in combat. This model can't this model can't physically target this model. So obviously, was you know still be able to shoot him, but we were doing it wrong supposedly. So um, yeah, that's that's a rule I'm not massively keen on. 
Um, I don't think it works. I don't think the mechanic works particularly very well. I, th I think they say that because of the, you know, the, the massive brawl that these two models are having, you might accidentally fight and roll in front of the character. This model might shoot his own model, possibly. Um, honestly, I think that's. I don't think that's massive. Well, it's, they're at least giving you a you know a fluffy fluffy reason behind it. You know, but game wise, you know that model isn't the closest model that's fair enough but you know that model isn't a target you can't physically target it so you should be able to shoot that but you can't but as rules wit as rules written he isn't the closest enemy model this one is so you can't physically shoot at that character unfortunately so that's cleared that up that's something that i'm not particularly keen on um, whether they change that in a future edition who knows So let's go into the sidebars. Fast dice basically means rather than rolling one dice at a time, you roll, you know, a, a number of dice. If you've got 20 shots, don't roll them one at a time because it will take forever. Just roll 20 shots. <laughs> um, aura abilities: some abilities, some uh, characters, which are obviously people with the character keyword, have some special abilities. I'm pretty sure if your character is labelled as a character, it has got a special, a form of special ability. Um, which usually means anything within so many inches of that character, it's usually six inches, but I've not read all the data sheets and stuff. Um, any friendly model within six inches of a character gains the ability that it gives. Uh, it gives example here, so um, basically a Nurgle Lord has uh, a gift ability which affects all Death Guard models within seven inches. Oh, I see that's seven inches, not six, uh, of him. So any any friendly model with or any friendly death guard model using them keywords again within so many inches of him gains that special ability. So that's covered that. So up here obviously weapon types. Now we've covered weapon types already, so assault we've done, heavy we've done, rapid fire we've done, grenade. Quickly do a grenade as well. Uh, each time a unit shoots, a single model in the unit equipped with grenades it may throw one instead of firing its own weapons exactly the same as previous edition only one model can throw a grenade so use a grenade in your um, index and shoot with it why not some some grenades are really good some grenades are a bit naff you might not want to use it pistols <clears throat> um, a model can fire a pistol even if there is an enemy unit within one inch so basically what this signifies is you can't fire at enemy models if they're within one inch unless you have a pistol. So if you have a pistol and you're in close combat, you can actually shoot your pistols into close combat and then attack with your combat weapon. If you are four inches away from an enemy model but you have a pistol, you can shoot your pistols into combat. I believe, if that's if I'm wrong, you know, comment and let me know. Um, but that's how, me and, that's how me and a few of my friends were playing it. So obviously you can shoot your pistols basically as and when you want to. Pistols aren't massively great these days, um, unless you've got a plasma pistol or a melter pistol, something like that. So we're going to resolving attacks. Okay, resolving attacks. So when you resolve an attack, you roll your hit. Basically, you roll your hit. <laughs> if your ballistic skill is three plus, you need a three plus to hit whatever you're shooting at. If your ballistic skill is four plus, you need a four plus to hit whatever you're shooting at. That's how simple it is, really. Um, some models on their data sheet have special abilities that give you minus one to shoot at them, or psychic powers if they're, if they're cast on a friendly unit. So, if you're shooting at, say, a unit of dark held mandrakes, you are minus one to shoot them. So, a space me needs threes. Minus one, or I suppose it would be plus one to shoot them. So you're basically hitting the mandrakes on fours rather than threes. Flies are the same. Uh, you can shoot flies now on normal ballistic skill because it's just classed as a uh, as an enemy model. It's not classed as being mega mega quick. So you can still shoot flies on normal ballistic skill. Um, I'm not. I'm still not keen on that mechanic. Um, I think flying a jet fighter like a harrier jump jet if that's flying around the sky you're not going to be able to hit it with a shotgun easily it, it, it was it would be possible 
but it'd be very, very, very hard. Um, yeah, I'm not massively keen. I think it should be at least minus two or minus three to hit um, a flyer. Um, I don't think it should be just standard ballistic skill minus one. Um, but anyway, that's a mechanic I'm not massively keen on. Um, I still think people should be able to shoot at flyers. You know, that's fine. Um, but minus one, I don't think minus one's a, a big enough deal. Um, maybe if maybe in people's data sheets they should they should have if they're good at shooting at flowers they should have plus one to shoot at models with the fly keyword um, and then I think fly should have a, a keyword saying you know if if they're fast or supersonic or whatever I think supersonic just gives you extra movement um, or minus one to shoot I can't remember off the top of my head now but it should be harder to hit than just minus one ballistic skill or plus one ballistic skill however you want to do it um, anyway to wound roll. Now the wounding has changed quite significantly from seventh edition. Remember the seventh edition you had um, <clears throat> obviously a chart that you'd follow. So the strength of your weapon would probably be down the side, and the toughness of your opponent would be across the top. So you'd obviously you know strength strength five, toughness four. You'd obviously just measure them down, and whatever it whatever it says in the middle, that's what you need to roll to wound. They've made it very very streamlined, very very simple now. So this chart here, um, which is, uh, let's start off at the top. If the strength is twice or more than the toughness, you wound on a two plus. So you have to physically be two times stronger than your opponent is tough. So if you are strength seven and your opponent is toughness four, it is threes because it is, um, is the strength greater than the toughness, it's threes. It's not double, it's greater than it, it's not the same, so it's greater. So it's threes to end. Um, whereas obviously in previous editions it was twos. Um, if the strength is equal to the toughness, so if it's exactly the same, it's fours, which hasn't changed, and you know, that's fine, it's, that's always been like that. If the strength is lower than the toughness, it's fives. If the strength is half than the toughness, it's sixes. So if you're shooting your strength 4 bolter against a Wraith Knight, which is toughness 8, it's 6 is to wound. Which is how it was, um, but something like a Tau Pulse Rifle, I think they're called, um, is strength 5. So strength 5 against toughness 8, you actually wound it on 5s. Um, yeah, yeah, poor Wraith Knight. Um, the, the rule of the game that we played, it, it didn't really come into a massive effect because obviously I was using poison. I was, I was uh, playing as Dark Eldar. Um, so it didn't come into effect massively because I was wounding pretty much everything on fours anyway, apart from vehicles, which I can now win with poison, um, that, which just wounds on sixes. So you, it's almost like you're shooting at a guy, a guy against one creature. <coughs> yeah, but my opponent, on the other hand, I, I did feel the sting of that quite a bit. Um, I mean, he had strength four guns firing at my raiders. Um, my raiders were uh, toughness six because people that are, people that are watching this that might know it had the homunculus covens key, wo key word. So because my um, homunculus within, was within six inches of it, it gave it plus one toughness. So it's usually toughness five, but I made it toughness six. Yeah, his strength four guns were firing at it. And in the previous edition, it would have been sixes, so it would have been you know, quite survivable. Um, but because it wasn't double, it was actually wounded on fives. Um, now I don't think it's after playing it, it's not such a big deal. I was dead against this chart uh, to start off with uh, before playing the game. Um, but after playing a few games, it's quite harsh on the receiving end, but then again, it's 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 insane benefit for you. Um, I think it it just means that games are going to be a lot quicker. Um, the games that I've played, the games that I've seen, you know, really really struggle to last over five turns. Um, you know, games like previous edition, the game can last up to seven turns, um, but things die really really quickly um, in this edition. Um, so yeah, that's basically the wound chart. Um, I probably will keep it. For, for a few more games to see how we go uh, whether I'll change it or not I don't know uh, but at the minute I will keep it and obviously keep playing it see how it goes um, again like I said it's not made a massive impact because it affects both players um, it just means that not everything's wounding on twos or fours all the time so it's not too bad
Right, allocating wounds, which is this one at the top. Okay, allocating wounds. If an attack successfully wounds a target, the player commanding the target unit allocates the wounds to them to any model in the unit. So that basically means you can choose your well if you're if your space marines are shooting at a I don't know, an Incubi squad, um the person that's in charge of the Incubi can choose who takes the wounds. So they can be from the person in the front, they can be from the person in the middle, they can be on the clavex, they can literally be on whoever he wants. Um, which can be you know very, very tactical at the end of the day. If you're if you want to if you want to be charging next turn, you might want to take the models off the from the front to stop your opponent charging you. Um, if you're being shot up from Overwatch, you want to take the models at the back. Um, so obviously you've got more models that are closer to your enemy to you know, to, you know, to, ch to charge with. Um, you can obviously allocate wounds to mod <coughs> you know, models with a better save throw, um, which then takes us onto the terrain and cover section here. So it states here in the, in the terrain, and cover, co uh, terrain and cover section, the battlefields of the far future are littered with terrain features such as terrain, craters and twisted corpses. Models can take shelter uh, within such terrain features to gain protect protection against oncoming weapons, oncoming weapon fire. A unit, uh, if a unit is entirely on or within any terrain feature, add one to its model saving throw. Um, add one to its model saving throw against shooting attacks to represent the cover uh, received from the terrain. Invulnerable saves are not affected. Units gain no benefit from cover in the fight phase. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. So what the, what this basically states is if you you've got to basically it's very very literal in how it's how it states things. So if a unit is entirely on or within terrain, that means if you've got 10 models, one model isn't in it, it isn't classed as actually being in terrain. If you've got, <coughs> if you've, uh, I've seen some people say that if a tank isn't within a crater, it doesn't get a cover save. But it does get a cover save. It doesn't actually mean that. Um, it states in the back, um, which we'll come to in a bit, that vehicles things with a vehicle type have to be in terrain so they have to be completely in it and they have to be more than 50 percent obscured so models are a lot easier to to get in the terrain vehicles not so much now the only problem i've got with this is games workshop obviously sell their terrain without bases so how would you justify if a model is completely within terrain um have I got any pieces of terrain around? Yes, one second. Let's just quickly grab one here. I've got one here. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's not painted. Um, so obviously this is going to be one of the next projects. Um, so obviously Games Workshop terrain. Um, standard Games Workshop terrain actually. It's very, very spiky. I just stabbed myself in it. Um, yeah, it doesn't come with a base. So all I've done is obviously mounted it on a bit of wood. I've sanded it, uh, stoned it as well, put, put a bit of extra rubble on it. Now, what do you class as, what does it state, state here? If a unit is entirely on or within any piece of terrain. So how, I think they need to clarify this a bit better. So if you're on it, you know, that's fair enough. So you have to, if you've got 10 space marines, all 10 space marines have to be on that piece of terrain. So your class is on it. In it, how would that work? Do you have to be, because obviously imagine Games Workshop don't sell the bases. So how how would it work? Would you have to join imaginary line from point A to point B? So everything from from that's, that side of the line, so this side, so everything this side of the line, would that get its cover save? Um, luckily I do all my things with bases. So I would just class that everything that is on a terrain base gains the cover. Um, some people don't put them on bases. That's fine. I think I think it's a case of people just have to do you know play with their own preference, play with house rules, however they want to do it. So that's what that's how I do that. So going back to this rule, 
allocating wounds. If you've got nine, if you've got obviously ten models in, or nine models in a piece of terrain, one model is out of the terrain. Um, I believe this has been FAQ'd as well. Um, by all means, comment and let me know that I'm right or wrong, so I can get so I can get it right when I start playing games. When you're allocating wounds, if you allocate your first wound to the model that is not in terrain, obviously he won't have it. He won't have a save bonus. So if if he passes, he passes. Great stuff. If he fails, he, obviously he's dead. Um, depending on what model it is, obviously. But then, if that one model is dead, the entire unit is then in that piece of terrain. So allocating wounds can be quite important from in a shooting perspective. So your marines that have a obviously a three plus save. Your 10 unit of marines, we'll, we'll keep referring to these 10 units, this unit of 10 marines. Um, yeah, the unit of 10 marines that are heading or are nearly in the cover get a 3 plus save basic because one marine has decided to sit outside like a douche and not make it into the terrain piece. So that one marine is spoiling it for the rest of the squad. So, yeah, shame on him. But you can allocate wounds to that one marine. So your one lone marine with a bolter that is sitting outside the cover, ruining everybody's day. You can allocate your first wound to him. He might be the closest, he might be the furthest away, he might be the guy in the middle. But if you allocate your first wound to him, if he fail if he passes that save, you know, he's still spoiling the day for everybody, but you know, at least he's still alive. If he dies, then you can add plus one to um saving throws for the entire squad so the entire squad gains an additional plus one save so as soon as he dies <clears throat> all space means have a two plus armor save if they're in if they're in cover so allocate wounds can be very very important very 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 very, very tactical right which brings us on to save throws which i've covered um obviously if you you're wounded you take a save you say you take an armor save uh, armor saves are basically said on your uh, data sheet, like I say, marines have plus one save. <clears throat> For people that have an armor penetration characteristic, so weapons have an AP, um, it's a bit different compared to how the ass system worked. Obviously if you were shot by a bolt gun in 7th uh, edition, it had an AP of 5, so everything with a 5 plus save just, just didn't, have, didn't have a save. It's changed now, so weapons have an AP. Um, AP basically means you take that armor penetration away from your save. So if space marines are shot with something that is AP1, if, if little space marine Bob is still sat in the open like a douche, um, he's got a three plus save. If something shoots at him that's minus one AP, it's a four plus save. So it's slightly worse off because, this, because whatever shoot him has a minus one AP. If something has minus two AP, he has a five plus save, which makes makes it more likely that he's going to die. Well, that's when tactics come into it again, because if he dies first, the rest of the squad is still in cover, so they get the plus one save. So if something is minus two to their armor save, it, they should have only a five plus. Sorry, if something is minus two AP, they should only have a five plus armor save. But because they're in cover. They get plus one to that, so it's actually only a four plus armor save. So again, you know these these three things are actually you know quite good in, in conjunction with each other. And then at the end here at the bottom, <coughs> issuing damage. So after save after save throws have been done and failed, that's when you issue damage. Now weapon all weapon types come with a damage. A lot of things are damage one, so bolters are one. You know, basically all like small arms fire or damage one. But when you come into <coughs> heavier weapons, like say that's the Space Marine Last Cannon, Space Marine Last Cannon does D6 wounds. So you roll to hit, you roll to wound, wherever you're wounding takes its armor save. If he fails, it then Last Cannons do D6 wounds. So that means basically you roll a dice and that is how many wounds it takes. So if a Last Cannon is firing at a, I don't know, uh, Dark Eldar Venom. The Dark Eldar Venom's hit. It's wounded. Um, it doesn't get an armor save. Um, it has got an vulnerable, but let's just say it fails that. Um, 
it inf then inflicts d6 damage because it, because it allows kind of does d6 damage. Some things do 2d6 damage. Some things do 2d6, 2d6 damage. You choose the highest. Some things do d3 damage. Some things just do a straight six, you know, straight three damage, straight two damage, whatever. So that's when you inflict your damage. So your last cannon rolls a five, does five damage. The, the venom then takes five wounds in total. Um, so yeah, venom's having a bad day. Um, could roll a six, and then the venom, venom's having an even worse day because it's dead. <coughs> so. We've covered most things here, so we've covered terrain and cover, it's quite an important feature, uh, something to remember, but it's something that you must, must remember and get right. All models need to be in the cover to get it, and vehicles need to be 100% in it, and at least 50% obscured. Mortal wounds, we've covered mortal wounds already. Basically, if you're taking a mortal wound, you're taking that mortal wound, unfortunately. Invulnerable saves. Basically, you, you are, you're always going to get your invulnerable save unless and unless something is shot at you that causes a mortal wound, which ignores your invulnerable save. But um, so if if a if something has uh, AP four, you, you're basically not going to get an armor save against it, but you will always get your invulnerable save. So you know things with invulnerable saves obviously are quite good. Which from what I've seen in this edition, a lot of things have invulnerable saves, which I'm really surprised about. <clears throat> Next, the charge phase. Right, the charge phase. So, sequence, charge sequence. Choose a unit to charge with. Charge the units. The unit resolves Overwatch, so the, the enemy unit. And then roll 2d6 to make the charge move. Okay, so if you've got three units that want to charge something you declare you've, you know, again it's, it's very important that you must declare uh, that unit's charging that unit's charging and that unit's charging um, so you then choose your targets who you're going to charge against so this chart this unit is going to charge them this charge unit is going to charge them this unit is going to charge them kind of thing so you must always choose and declare who and what you're charging very important that you do this um, so your opponent knows and obviously you can keep track of what you're doing. If you're anything like me, you usually forget. So yeah, it's always nice to say it out loud. Sometimes it feels like you're talking to yourself, but you know, who doesn't talk to themselves every now and again? I'm talking to a camera right now, so it's not far off talking to himself. Um, right, resolve and overwatch. <clears throat> Basically, if you're charging a unit, it can shoot you back. Same as 7th edition. Um, it is sixes to hit you unless stated in their data sheet. Some units have, you know, fives hit you, some are fours, some even hit you on normal ballistic skill. But it must state it in their specific data sheet, which is why the indexes are very, very important. Um, now, the thing that it states here is, uh, okay, let's read it out, shall we? Each time a charge is declared against a unit, the target unit can immediately fire Overwatch <coughs> at the would-be attacker. The target unit can potentially fire Overwatch several times a turn, which basically means each your unit can shoot Overwatch as many times as it want to. You know, as, as many want to is that even a word? As many times as it can do, so it can shoot shoot Overwatch all the time. Basically, you're not just limited to shooting it once. Um, can potentially fire Overwatch several times a turn. Right? Uh, yeah, uh, although it cannot fire if there are an enemy unit. If there are enemy models within one inch of it, so <clears throat> you've chosen who wants to charge. <clears throat> you've chosen your units. This enemy unit wants to charge first, or this your friendly unit wants to charge first. Enemy unit fires Overwatch and does no damage or whatever. This unit, this unit friendly unit that wants to charge, rolls a double one, so it fails to charge completely. This unit wants to charge this unit enemy unit fires overwatch again at this unit this unit actually makes it into combat so you had a third unit that wants to charge that one unit as well these one unit and one enemy unit's not not going to have a good day here um but say you've got another say you so say you've got three units that want to charge <coughs> your third unit that wants to charge an en this enemy unit has already got an enemy unit within 1 inch of it so it can't fire overwatch so this unit can charge freely. Um, that's fine. I think that makes a lot. I think that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, if you've got an enemy right in your right in your grill, you know you can't really shoot at them. 
Um, so enemies resolve overwatch, uh, make the charge move. There's no difference here. Basically you roll 2d6 and that's how far you charge. Some models can re-roll that. Some models have a slightly longer charge. Some models can add <coughs> additional movement to their charge. Um, yeah, that's quite cool. Something to add at the bottom here, heroic intervention. <coughs> uh, if the if the enemy has completed all their charge moves, so that's it. So as soon as the enemy has completed all the charge moves, they've all been done and dusted. Any of your characters that are within three inches of an enemy unit may perform a heroic in, may perform a heroic intervention. Any that do so can move up to three inches so long as they end their move closer to the nearest enemy model. Okay, so this means your unit here that's been engaged by two enemy units. Um, so they're both in close combat with her. If you've got a friendly character here, he can move three inches, but he must move closer to the nearest enemy model. So there's no moving away because the enemy model is closer. You must move closer. So your your combat characters are going to love this because they can actually move into combat. If they are within three inches away from the combat, they can actually move three inches into combat. And if you're within one inch of that enemy model, you can attack it in combat. So that's some, something to something to remember. Quite some, something that we have used, or something that I've used in other games, <clears throat> and it does work really, really well. Models that aren't particularly kitted out for combat, obviously you're not going to move them closer. You're going to hopefully stay away, <laughs> unless you want them to die. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, charge phase, fight phase. <clears throat> Right, fight phase. It's all done in a sequence again. <coughs> so you choose a unit to fight with, pile in up to three inches, choose targets, choose melee weapon, and then you resolve the close combat attack. So you make hit roll, make wound roll, enemy allocates wounds, enemy makes saving throws, inflict damage, and consolidate up to three inches. So again, you. <coughs> this is where it's a bit different compared to previous editions. So you choose which charge you want to do first. Now charges, units that charge always fight first because now there's no initiative value. There's no, um, you know, you charge me in cover so I get to go first unless you've got grenades kind of thing. If you charged, you're attacking first. Uh, I really like this mechanic. Um, I'm really glad they brought it back from previous editions. Um, it makes Tyranids, Orcs, um, basically low initiative armies, you know, a lot better, that, that are designed for combat. So if you charge, you go in first, which is good. Um, so you do all of your charges first. So if you've got three units that successfully charged, you do all of them first. Now you choose which fight you want to do first, so you choose charge one first, then you, then you do charge two, then you do charge three. So you get to do all your fights first. So your <coughs> your space means that have been charged by corn berserkers. Corn berserkers go first, uh, so you're going to choose that one first. So piling, so so piling basically means you can move each model in the unit up to three inches. Uh, this move can be in any direction so long as model ends its move closer to the nearest enemy model. So if you've got um, corn berserkers that are at the back of the unit, that obviously the guys in the front are still in combat. Um, the guys in the back obviously can move three inches forward, three inches into the combat, so obviously just piling them in, which is cool, which is fair enough. Uh, choose the targets. First, you must pick the target unit or unit. First, you must pick the target unit or units uh, for the attacks. To target enemy unit, the attacking model must be within one inch of that unit or within one inch of another model from its own unit itself within one inch of an enemy model so that basically signifies that you've got to be within one inch of an enemy model friendly models can be within one inch of you of that person that's already in combat so it basically means that, you know fighting in two ranks so you so you get maximum number of attacks <coughs> um, you can split your attacks which is nice so if you've got 
Uh, say you've got, say you're in combat with a vehicle and a enemy unit, and your Chaos Space Marine Sergeant is armed with a power fist. You can say, right, all of my sergeant's power fist attacks are going to be on the dreadnought. Obviously, your your spot sergeant has to be within one inch of that dreadnought to use, uh, you know, to use that. Um, so you're going to have sergeant's attacks against the dreadnoughts. So you've got power fist, do more damage, obviously. And then the normal guys are going to be against the marines. So that's, that's how you split your attacks, basically. Obviously, you know, same again. A good mechanic. It should be like that. Um, but you've got to make sure that you use that pile in move to move closer to to whatever you're going to attack. <coughs> Uh, number of attacks. Um, obviously, each model has its own attack char characteristic, exactly the same as previous editions. <coughs> Choose a melee weapon. Now, the way uh, the reason why it states this is because models can be armed with two melee weapons. So, if you're armed with two melee weapons, say you've got two attacks, you can attack with a knife, which is just basically um, range and obviously melee type, melee strength as the user. Uh, no AP. It just does one damage, so most things are armed with just a bog standard knife, fist, sharp stick, whatever you want to call it. But obviously if you've got a combat weapon, you're obviously going to use that combat weapon because it's going to have some form of bonus anyway. Like a chainsaw, I believe a chainsaw gives you one extra attack if you use a chainsaw. So if you've got two attacks, you're not going to go, I'm going to use this crappy little stick and my chainsaw. You're going to say, I'm just going to use my chainsaw, so you're going to attack twice uh, twice with a chainsaw and you get your three attacks, so that's three attacks. Um, but if, you, if you've got like a power fist and a, I don't know, power sword, you might say I'm going to use, depending on how many attacks you've got obviously, you might say you're going to use two attacks with a power fist and one attack with a power sword. So you, you can swap and change you know, what you're attacking with as long as you've got it in your character profile or you've paid the points for it when you play match play. Um, resolve close combat attacks. Obviously you've got your, your weapon skill now which is just 3 plus 4 plus whatever, is, whatever it says on your data sheet. Um, some models... Uh, some models might have special rules where it's harder to hit them, or some some might even have rules that it's easier to hit them. Um, you know, there, I think there is a couple out there. I can't think of think of any off the top of my head, but you know, you never know. You never know. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so resolve your close combat attacks so that you, threes to hit for Space Marines. If they've all just got standard weapons, they all just get one attack each. Strength is the user. It's got no AP. Damage one. Um, so then obviously you do your wound allocation, so your your opponent will have obviously allocate who's taken who's gonna take what wound, then he's gonna do who's gonna do what save. <clears throat> Resolve your damage. Um I don't need to go into that because it's exactly the same um as a shooting. So uh allocate wounds, save throws, inflict damage, exactly the same. Once that's all done, you can then consolidate. If you completely wipe out a unit um, you can consolidate up to three inches. Now there's no D6 anymore; it is just a straight three inches. But you must consolidate towards the nearest enemy model. So there's no moving sideways, there's no moving backwards. You must consolidate closer to the enemy model. <coughs> okay, yes. Yeah, so it, actually reading it here it might help if I actually read it for a change. You can consolidate in any direction, but you must be closer to the nearest enemy model. So you can't. You can't move backwards. You can move sideways and be half an inch closer or a millimetre closer if you want to. <coughs> but you must actually finish closer than the enemy model. You don't have to consolidate. You can just stop where you are if you want to. Um, but it doesn't actually state that you can't consolidate into combat. So because it doesn't state it, I imagine you just can do. Um, so yeah, so there's a little tactic there. Don't keep your units really close to each other. That's a really bad thing. Um... Yeah, I really like the combat phase. I think the combat, I think the uh, combat phase is going to be really brutal. Um, the games that I've played, it has been like really harsh. Uh, I've, I've took a unit of grotesques in one game, and they just they just butchered lots of stuff. They are really really harsh. Um, multi wounded models, 
with lots of attacks are just going to be vicious. Um, I, th I think combat is back in, in this in eighth edition. Combat combat is back in a big way. Seventh edition was a lot of shooting. Seventh edition was the the age of shooting death. This edition <clears throat> is fairly balanced, but combat is where it's at. Combat is just you know just beast. If you've got combat units, you, you're going to do well. Um, so if you've not noticed, there's obviously no taking leadership, there's no combat resolution now. <coughs> you just basically, you don't take them anymore. Um, what you have now is something called the morale phase. So that's how combat works when you're charging. So like I say, everything that's charged goes first unless states in yours or your opponent's data sheet. Once you've done all, once you've resolved all of your charges, so obviously all your charges go first, you then choose which combats you're going to do next. So do all your charges first, charges because the charges always go first. You then choose alternately who's going to do what combat next. So if you've got if you've got five close combats on the, on the board, three of them have charged, you, you've got to do those three first, because those three go first. <clears throat> Again, in less data than the um, data sheet of your opponent or you or whoever. The other two are chosen um, alternately. So because it's whoever's player turn it is, it chooses first. So <coughs> if it's my player turn, I've done my three charges, I then choose which combat to do next. So the two the two combats that are ongoing, I, I can choose, see I choose combat A. So I choose combat A, so I go first in that, <coughs> I attack. And then we go to combat B, because it's my opponent's choice. Now, now my opponent can choose to fight with combat um, the, the other three that I've already done, because you know the one with the, with the charges, you can choose any. Of the, you can choose M three to do if he wants first or now. You can choose the combat that we've just done to fight back in if he wants to, or he can choose the the other one that nobody's fought in yet to try and whittle my unit down first, which I think is really really good. Uh, I think it's a really good mechanic doing alternate um, combats and stuff. Uh, I think it makes it a lot fairer. It's a lot adds a lot of tactics to the game. Um, it's it's only taken precedence in two of my games, I believe. Um, but it worked out really, really well. Um, obviously, there's no point. Your opponent is not going to choose the combats that have already happened because they're not going to benefit him. He might as well choose a combat that hasn't happened to whittle your your combat unit down. Um, so yeah, you take you do charges first. You then alternate choosing who does um, who does what combat next. And obviously that's all your combat's done. Once that's all your combat's done, we're into the morale phase. So in the morale phase, <coughs> starting with the player turn, who's it, it, starting with the player whose turn it is, players must take morale tests for units from their army that have had models slain during the turn. So if you've had models, this is something you, you, you're going you're gonna to have to keep track of. Um, whether it's worth just having a dead pool or a dead... Oh, Deadpool is not the comic book character, um, although that'd be pretty cool. Um, whether it's worth having putting models to one side that have died from you know per squad, or I don't. Th uh, me and my opponent just just put all our models to one side. We'd, we'd then actually lose track of who's died, who's done what. <coughs> I think bigger games would be a lot harder to track if you do that. Uh, smaller games aren't so bad, um, but keeping track of what's died and what hasn't. From what squad is some, something very important that you're going to have to remember. You're going to have to, you're going to have to do it right as well. Do it correctly. Um, okay, so your Space Marine squad, which we we've been using majority of this uh, majority of this video now. Um, he lost Bob, Space Marine Bob, who was standing outside of cover like a douche. He died from shooting, unfortunately. The unit got charged by unit of corn berserkers. Um, you managed to kill a few of the corn berserkers, so there wasn't many left. But you still lost, um, you still lost five models in combat. So your ten-man squad has now been reduced to four man. You know, four men, in, you know, it's, it's not. It does happen, and it, it will happen because this edition is brutal. Um, 
So to make a morale test, roll a dice and add the number of models from that unit that have been slain this turn. If the result of the morale test exceeds the highest leadership characteristic <coughs> in the unit, the test is failed. For each point that the test is failed by, one model in the unit must flee and be removed from play. You may choose which models flee uh, for the units that you command. Um, yeah, that's it's brutal. Basically, there's no no more uh, fleeing. There's no more um, fleeing mechanic. Obviously, you know you roll two d six and run, or you can rally them, or this that, the other. There's no such thing as that anymore. It's a morale phase. So your space marine unit that has now only got four left lost six models that turn. Ding. So basically, what that means is you roll a d6 you add six to that dice roll now i believe a, a basic space marines leadership is seven uh, and the sergeant is obviously leadership eight so your sergeant's still alive because you can allocate wounds you're obviously going to let your sergeant die last in some cases you might let him die first you, you might do it you know it, it might be tactically better for him to die first you know i don't know um so you roll a dice say you roll a three you add six to that, which would make it nine. Obviously, three add six equals nine. Um, because nine exceeds your leadership of eight, so by one, so you lose. So basically, you needed to roll under, you know, two or one, basically, but you rolled a three. So because you rolled a nine, basically, you needed an eight. One model, either. You know, Ron Model is just removed as a casualty, whether he dies from wounds in battle, he runs away, he tactically withdraws, or he falls down a, um, a black hole, <laughs> or he's randomly eaten by a piece of foliage, or whatever. Um, that model is literally just removed as, as a casualty. Uh, some armies can completely ignore this phase. It's basically the old fearless rule. If, if you're I don't know what the the new ruling is because each 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 army has its own naming for it basically, um, but you, it is possible to to ignore the the um, morale phase if you've got a special rule in your data sheet that specifically says so. So, and this big big old box here, we've got transports. So we'll quickly cover transports while we're here. Okay, transports. Some models are noted as being transports on their data sheet. Um, the fairy warriors to and from the front line providing them with speed and protection. Uh, the following rules describe how units can embark and disembark from transports. Okay. <coughs> transport capacity, nothing's changed. Every model has a transport capacity, so raid, um, Dark Allah Raiders are 10, <coughs> Wave Serpents are 12, Rhinos are 10. Um, everything has a transport capacity. It specifically states it in their data sheet of what they can transport and how many they can transport. Embarking. <clears throat> um, if all models in the unit end their movement within three inches of a friendly transport, they can embark within it. So it's not just the door now. The door actually means nothing. You can embark anywhere. You can climb through the viewport you can climb through the exhaust you can climb through an open hatch you can possibly climb through the gun barrel if, if you really want to um, if you're within three inches of that model at all you can embark on it um, embark units cannot normally do anything or be affected in any way whilst embarked on a unit um, unless specifically stated with abilities so basically if you're in a transport you can't be targeted you can't be affected nothing can happen to you basically unless it specifically states in your data sheet um, it's quite an important thing these data sheets if you've not got one of your indexes for your armies I'd recommend going and getting it they're only 15 quid but I'll talk about indexes in the end um, if a transport is destroyed any units embarked within it immediately disembark see below which we'll do that one in a minute uh, before the transport is removed uh, you must then roll one dice for each model you just set up on the battlefield. So if you've got ten models in a uh, in a raider, you roll a die, you roll ten dice. Any ones, a model is removed. So there's no save, there's no invulnerable save, there's no nothing. It is literally removed. Even if it's got one wound, if it's got ten wounds, if it's got twenty wounds, if it's got a million wounds, it is just removed. So 
transports that blow up with multi-wounded creatures in are very bad. <clears throat> but you can choose who is removed. So it's not random anymore. It's literally you know you can allocate who is removed as a as a as, as a casualty. Uh, disembark. Uh, any unit that begins its movement phase embarked within a transport can disembark before the transport moves. Uh, when a unit disembarks, <coughs> set up, set it up on the battlefield so that all models are. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I've got a terrible cough. Uh, so all models are within three inches of the transport and not within one inch of an enemy model. Any disembarking models that cannot be set up in this way are slain. So, <coughs> you basically disembark three inches and that's any point in the model. Again, you can crawl out the exhaust, crawl out a gun barrel, crawl out wherever. It's literally just three, three inches from any part of the model. Um, disem uh, and, and the unit that disembarks can act normally. So you've disembarked three inches, you can then move, you can shoot, you can charge, you can fight. So you can actually disembark into combat. Somehow. I don't know how that works. But you can. Um, even though it states up here that you can't disembark within one inch of an enemy model. So it kind of contradicts in itself here. So basically if a rhino charges into combat, because rhinos can do that, um, it fights, your opponent decides to stay in, com stay in combat with the rhino. Your turn, the rhino's still alive. You can disembark three inches away, um, which which I've done, but obviously with a raider, not a rhino. Um, as long as you're not within one inch of an enemy model, you can then charge. In your turn, obviously. Um, note, though, that even um, if you don't move during the disembark, if you don't move the disembarking units further in your movement phase, they still can still count as having moved. Um, for any rules purposes, so f so for shooting heavy weapons, basically you're still at minus one for shooting. And I believe that is it. That's that is your basic rules. You obviously then go on to um, warlord traits. I'm not going to go into warlord traits um, missions, um, how to fight a battle. Um, I'm not going to go into that. I'll do a, a proper review on or tactical. Um, video of um, what to do and how I do it, all this and the other. So yeah, that's all missions. I will quickly cover command points. Um, yeah, quickly cover command points while I'm here. Okay, command points. If your army is battle forged, so that means if everything is basically comes from the same uh, the same codex, you automatically get three command points, which is very nice. Um, if you set your army up in a specific way, um, meaning you get additional co command points, um, obviously formations are all gone, um, so there's no more formations anymore, there's no more filth, cheese, whatever. Um, the, the, what it's been replaced by is, if I can find it, <coughs> is these attachments. So if you uh, fulfill a specific detachment, so a battalion detachment means you need to have two to three HQs, you must have three tr three troops minimum, so you must have two HQs minimum, you must have three troops minimum, everything else in grey there is an extra, you automatically gain three additional command points. So you start off with three for being battleforged, if you take a battalion detachment and you fulfill the requirements, you gain an additional three command points, so you have six command points. You can then take multiple detachments, so if you have two battalion detachments, so that would be a minimum of four HQ and a minimum of six troops, you'd gain an additional three command points, so there's nine command points. Command, command points at the bottom here, if you're playing match play, I will always be playing match play um, in my videos on YouTube. On the odd occasion I might do narrative play, maybe, see how we go, um, but I will always do match play. You can use one command point per turn, um, so, um, and you can't, but you can't use multiple command points, obviously at the same turn kind of thing. So, so you can use one command point to re-roll any single dice. So in the movement phase, you can re-roll command, you can re-roll your, your uh, advance if you really want to. I won't bother, it's a waste. Um, but in something like in your, in your shooting phase, <clears throat> your last cannon that missed, you can re-roll, you can use one command point and re-roll it. Um, if you roll a one on the damage chart, on the damage table, sorry, on your um, 
when you're rolling for damage, obviously it does d6 damage. If you roll a 1, you can use a command point and re-roll it. Um, Counter-offensive is 2 command points. Um, basically, this stratagem is used right after an enemy unit that charged has fought. Select one of your own units, your own eligible units that can then fight. So, when I say that all charge units go first, <coughs> they do. So, but to use this, one enemy unit must have done their charges, must have done a charge first. So you can't just use it straight away. You've got, <coughs> unfortunately, you've got to let your opponent do one charge and then you interrupt to do this one. And finally, is insane bravery, which is in the morale phase. It is two command points. And you automatically pass a single morale phase. So if you've got if you've got ten marines, um, eight of them die. You've only got two left, but you really need that them two marines to stay alive. Um, you, you can use your insane bravery because obviously you roll a d6 and you've lost eight. So eight plus d6, that unit's going to run away unless you use your two command points to automatically pass it. <clears throat> so command points are very very big thing in the new um you know the new 40k um they, they can be the be all and end all of a game and they are very very helpful um coming from someone that's that's played them and you know used them in, in a few games um, they are very very helpful I, I would definitely recommend trying to have at least at least six in a thousand point game um yeah very very helpful um something you've got to keep track of as well because um, obviously you're going to use them throughout the game, whether you have a turn counter or mark them out with dice or whatever. So that is my <coughs> review on the new 40k. <coughs> like I say, I've played a few games now. Um, my overall opinion of it is I'm happy with it. I'm happy to play it. Um, I was a bit optimistic to start off with when I, you know, when I first heard a lot of uh, rumours <coughs> and rules and things online. But yeah, um, overall I'm very happy with it. There's a few th bits and bobs I wasn't massively enthusiastic about, like the wound chart. Um, but after actually playing it, it's it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. <clears throat> I'm I'm still still not happy about flyers. I think flyers are, are very very. Um, I don't think they're going to be um, as deadly as they were in previous editions. Not that they were overpowered in previous edition. But the fact that you obviously took flies to, to, to combat flies and, and in actual warfare, you know, that's that's what you do. You take anti flyer to deal with flyers, you know, is what you do. Um, rather than not have to worry about them. I, I don't think they're as effective as they were. Um, whether they'll be whether they'll be used, you know, largely in competitive games or not, I don't know. Um But yeah, if, if I was had to if I had to mark this edition as being is it my favourite edition? Um, I'm really glad that they've started everything from scratch. <coughs> yeah. I'm really glad everything is, is started at ground zero. Everything is on a level playing field. Um, every option in an army is a, is a viable option. You know, there's, there's no auto includes now. There's no auto ignores. Um, I think this edition is very good. Um, I think it's very streamlined. I think it's very easy. I think some parts are too easy. Um, I like the way they've, they've done everything with keywords. So if something's got a specific keyword, it can do this. If it's not got that keyword, it can't do that. Um, I think. Do I think it's going to be abused? Of course I think it's going to be abused. I, th I don't think it matters what game you play. There are people out there that will abuse it, that will break the, the system. Uh, I've I've heard and seen a couple of things that I've you know I've even thought of things myself to break certain things but will I use it no because it would just make me look a douche um, but yeah hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more uh, 8th edition battle reports on the channel soon um, if you like this video please like it and you know subscribe it, you know it, it does help us out we're, we're slowly getting there now um, We've got quite a few subscribers, just over 250 mark, I think, now. Um, I've done a lot more scenery, <clears throat> so we'll be able to change the scenery up a lot more. I'm working on more scenery now. I'm working on other armies. Yeah, so I've done a lot more scenery, um, working on uh, extra armies and things for the channel. Uh, my opponents are obviously working on other things as well. Aiden's working on another army. Simon's working on another army. I'm, there's... There's uh, more people at my war local wargaming shop that want to come and uh, game. So yeah, so keep an eye out for extra 
content and um, please like and subscribe and I'll speak to you guys next time. Toodaloo.